I just don't like the man, Arthur. Never have. Vegas? Yeah. And I definitely don't know what you see in him. Well, he's smart. He's an intellectual. I was very impressed with the way he handled the British Reading Jail. Look, my lord, he thinks differently to you and I. I like him. Outside of yourself, not one person in that prison had a good thing to say about him. Conceited little man. Look, he's vain. And he's ambitious, but he is talented. Anyway, what are our options? Douglas turned you down. I'm sure I know. Look, I'd be willing to make Figgis acting chair, but retain the chair myself. You haven't the time, though. Anyway, you've far more pressing things to do than sitting around the table discussing the law. Look, make Figgis chair. Douglas will keep an eye on my report back to you. Robert James Patrick Mortiset, known as Patrick to his friends, born in London, father from Limerick, mother from Sligo, educated at King's College and the London School of Economics, fluent in French and German, resigned from the civil service in late 1922 and devoted most of his life to the Labour Party. In 1946, he was appointed as the first president of the Labour Court and was so difficult to appease that he was nicknamed Rigor Mortiset. <laughs> Edward Millington Stevens, known to us as Ned Stevens. He accompanied Michael as a legal draftsman during the London negotiations resulting in the Anglo-Irish Treaty. At Michael's behest, he was one of three men seconded from their civil service position to serve as joint secretary to the committee appointed by the provisional government to draft the constitution of the Irish Free State. Born in Dublin, his mother was a sister of the celebrated playwright John Millington Singh. Throughout his adult life, Ned was involved with the administration of the literary estate of his uncle, J.M. Singh, culminating in a biography published in 1959. 750,000 words, Ned. Extraordinary. <laughs> As the health and safety regulations for this room are very strict, it only allows us 26 people at any one time. There are 14 characters, six actors will play all of the characters, Otherwise, eight of you would have to leave. The first meeting of the committee was held on Tuesday, the 24th of January, 1922, at the Mansion House. Mr. Michael Collins, then leader of the provisional government and minister for finance, took the chair. Present were James Douglas, businessman, Professor James Murnahan, Hugh Kennedy, James McNeil, Darrell Figgis, Clement Front, John O'Byrne, at the secretary for myself, Ned and Patrick O'Toole. <clears throat> this committee has been called together for the purpose of drafting a constitution for the Irish Free State. I am here to give you the formal authorization of the provisional government. You're not to get bound up with legal formalities, but to put up a constitution for a free state and then present it to the provisional government who will fight for the carrying of it through. It is a question of status. We want definitely to define and produce a true democratic constitution. You are to bear in mind not the legalities of the past, but rather the practicabilities of the future. It has also been decided to appoint one of the committee members as chairman, whom the provisional government will look to for the return of its results, and who would be the person responsible to the government representing the committee. Mr. Arthur Griffith will propose a name. Thank you, Michael. Um, I would like to concur with what Michael has said, and uh, most importantly to reiterate that you are not to stand on legal formalities, but to make the Constitution as free as possible, unlike other constitutions. Um, I nominate, nominate Mr. Darrell Figgis as chairman of this committee. I second that. Very good. Well, if that is all, gentlemen, I shall take my leave. Well, very grateful to you for your contribution to this task. Right. The essential clause of the treaty, which I would like to bring the attention of the committee to, is Article 1. Now bear in mind that all the rest is a basis for a relationship between Ireland and England. You are to fit everything you can into the Constitution under Article 1. Article 1 of the treaty states that Ireland would have the same constitutional status in the British Empire as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, with a parliament having powers to make laws for the peace order and good government, and an executive responsible to that parliament. 
styled and known as the Irish Free State. I am happy, of course, for the committee to make its own arrangement, but one thing I do want to say is that Articles 3, 4, and 6 of the treaty should be left out of the Constitution altogether. Article 3, the representative of the Crown in Ireland shall be appointed in like manner to the Governor-General of Canada. Article 4, we do solemnly swear truth, faith, and allegiance to the Constitution of the Irish Free State as by law established, and that we will be faithful to His Majesty King George V. Huh. Well, that won't be happening anyway. And Article 6, until an arrangement has been made between the British and Irish governments whereby the Irish Free State undertakes her own coastal defence, the defence by sea of Great Britain and Ireland shall be undertaken by His Majesty's Imperial Forces. I'd like to make it clear that we consider a bicameral legislature necessary in order to give the Southern Union its fair play. Uh, excuse me, Michael, uh, may I? Uh, bicameral literally means two chambers and in practice refers to a government structure involving two houses or two legislative bodies that are separate in deliberation from one another. For example, the Shannon and the Doyle. So, in conclusion, there are four requirements within which this constitution must be drafted. Firstly, that it should provide for a free and democratic state. Secondly, that it should be within the treaty. Thirdly, that it should pro provide for a particular position of the six northeastern counties of Ulster and fourthly, that it should provide certain safeguards for the old unionist minority in other places of Ireland. Hugh Kennedy, Chief Legal Advisor to the Provisional Government, appointed Attorney General in 1922 and Chief Justice in 1924. He was to the fore in establishing a court system for the new state. The Provisional Government experienced considerable difficulty in obtaining the approval of the British Government for its proposals in this constitution. And Hugh was actively involved in frequent negotiations with his British counterparts. Now, will the draft constitution be submitted to the British government before going to the Irish Constituent Assembly? Excellent question, James. Mm -hmm. That point will require consideration. James Douglas. A young Dublin Quaker businessman, a nationalist. This whole outlook was changed when he became convinced after the 1916 Rising that home rule could never satisfy Ireland's nationalist aspirations. He has been a trustee and treasurer of the Irish White Cross Fund, American aid that alleviated suffering during the Civil War, where he met Clement France and was to play an honourable part in the efforts to end the Civil War. He later became the first vice chairman of the Irish Free State Senate. James saw his role in some measure as that of an agent for Michael on the Constitution Committee and complied with Michael's request to report regularly what, occur what occurred at meetings. Submitting a draft to the British government would not be acceptable to any of the existing British dominions. It is contrary to both the spirit and the letter of the treaty. We should urge the British to immediately pass a short act making provisions of the treaty legal, thereby making the adoption of a constitution by the Irish Parliament legal, according to British law. The passing of an Irish constitution through the British House, as suggested by you, would be rightly regarded by a very large number of the present supporters of the treaty as acceptance by our government of a position definitely subordinate to Great Britain and admitting the principle that even after the passing of the treaty, Power was derived from the British King, other than, as ought to be the case, from the people of Ireland. James, James, James. I don't want to get into that now. Look, I would advise this committee to ignore procedural questions and plunge vigorously into the work of the Constitution itself. It is imperative that this draft Constitution be with the provisional government before the 28th of February. The British have agreed to the process if we can get it to them by the middle of March. I would encourage you to keep the Constitution as simple as possible. In the simple draft suggested, this could act as our permanent Constitution, and it need never be altered. But it could be added to when the final stages of complete freedom are gained. All right? Good. Mr. Figgis, gentlemen. Oh, um, proposal by Mr. C.J. France. Mr. Clement France. American, 
worked on the White Cross Committee with James Douglas, who recommended him for this committee. Michael is happy to have him on the committee, but would like him to remain anonymous. I propose that this committee express its appreciation for the decision of the government that new members should only be added with the concurrence of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Front. Further, it is agreed no statement will be issued to the press regarding personnel of this committee. And it is agreed that Gavin Duffy should be requested to assist the committee. It is agreed that the committee should procure suitable rooms for the work of the committee. It is agreed the chairman should purchase a set of books for each member of the committee, including copies of the treaty. It is agreed the next meeting of the committee will be at the Mansion House on Thursday the 26th at 8 p.m. Actually, the second meeting of the committee was held here, in this room, on the 27th of January, 1922. The draft of the Constitution took 27 further meetings to be finalized. It is our intention to present the details of those 27 meetings in 27 minutes. <laughs> Darrell Figgis, the most unpopular and disliked man in Ireland. Even went to the Aran Islands, Ned, like your uncle, to learn Irish. And still the people hated him. That might be the case, James, but he still tops the polls. 15,000 votes in Dublin this year. Well, far face Ogoch. More a literary than a political man. Admittedly unpopular with a large number of people of varying points of view. Except in his obvious lack of personality, it has to be agreed he had a major influence on the shaping of the Constitution, both in his daily attendance at the committee and in subsequent debate in the Constituent Assembly. What lay ahead was scandal, tragedy, written out of Irish history. Your uncle could have written a good play about him, Ned. Good evening, gentlemen. Welcome to the second meeting of this committee. I would like to say a few words before we begin. Oh, well, here we go. <clears throat> During the early days of the Second French Republic, a customer entered a bookseller's and asked, have you a copy of the French Constitution? We do not, the bookseller politely replied, deal in periodical literature. <laughs> now, to any student of history, such a story is a short indication of the time of which it is told. He need not inquire to know that the time was one of revolution, change, and unsettlement. He also knows the mind of the people of that time, for insecure conditions, beget a nervous, restless fear. And these things are significant. They reveal a quality of constitution making that is not always or easily remembered. For Whatever changes may proceed in legislation, however many and rapid they may be, as long as the Constitution, written or unwritten, remains intact, the state at least is stable and its foundations are secure. Plainly, therefore, nothing should be written into a Constitution that is of a temporary, experimental, or questionable nature. A constitution is that which is permanent, as far as anything in the world may be permanent. To change it or recast it requires a revolution. It should therefore be the business of constitution makers to prescribe only what to them is fundamental and irrefutable, to lay down the secure foundations of their state and to leave all other matters to the experience of the nation. This then is the first definition of a constitution that it contains the fundamental law of the state, and only the fundamental law. I would like to- Item one on the agenda. New members. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Uh, the chairman intimated to me yesterday that the provisional government desired that Prof Professor Alfred O'Reilly from University College Cork should be added to the committee, and had asked him to make a suggestion to that effect to the committee. Proposed by the Chairman, seconded by Mr. John O'Byrne. Motion carried unanimously. Um, Mr. Gavin Duffy will be unable to join the committee, but will give whatsoever assistance that he can. Now, I believe an act should be passed without delay by the British government, ratifying the treaty, and thereby making the adoption of this constitution by the people of Ireland legal under such law. 
I mean, otherwise, there is a danger that the British might refuse to ratify the treaty if they do not like the constitution as passed by the Don. Well, respectfully, I remind this committee of our instruction from Mr. Collins. We are not negotiators. In this committee, our task is not to suit the British government, but the Irish people. Hugh Kennedy was supported by John O'Byrne from Tallow and County Carlow and educated at the Patrician Monastery and UCD. John enrolled in King's Inn in 1908 and was called up to the bar in 1911, where he practiced on the Leinster Court and was called up as a legal advisor to the Dáil delegation in negotiations leading to the Anglo-Irish Treaty of the 6th of December 1921. He succeeded Hugh Ken Kennedy as Attorney General and worked closely with James Murnan. James Murnahan and I were in the Jesuit University together. Born in St. Louis, Missouri, but an Oma man, true and true. Hugh was editor of the university magazine St. Stephen's, and I contributed articles regularly. With my good friend James Joyce, not one of your favorite people, Hugh. We had our differences. Hugh attacked James when he gave a paper on Ibsen, and again on his paper on James Lawrence Mangan. I like Joyce. We keep in touch. He never forgave me for winning the election for the Order of the Society. If I may, I wish to read you a letter I wrote yesterday to the chairman requesting a meeting to discuss a number of financial details of some importance. <coughs> I had a conversation with Arthur Griffith on Wednesday and went ahead and made a number of arrangements. I have arranged a suite of rooms here at this hotel at 17 guineas a week. Uh, firing for each of these rooms at 30 shillings a week. This won't complete the expense as the committee is sitting for long and continuous sessions and as a result of yesterday's experience, I will order tea while we are engaged in this way. Uh, the committee has decided to order a number of books, uh, each member of the committee to have one complete set. I now learn that these may be ordered through the stationery office but this will prove impossible for us, I fear, for the stationery office generally takes about a fortnight to get a book from the London publishers, and by the arrangements I have made with the Irish bookshop, I am having these books telegraphed for, and already some of them have arrived. <laughs> I have engaged two typists at three pounds each a week, and an office boy and a messenger. Similarly, the committee decided to purchase the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> this required to be paid for in advance, so, I have paid the necessary 28 pounds out of my own pocket. I suggest that you meet the bills incurred separately and allot me a sum, say 300 or 400 pounds for current expenditure, and I will appoint one of my staff as bursar, all accounts to be returned to you and checked by your staff. There, that. Is everybody in favor of the arrangements? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh. Also, I became aware of the Freeman's Journal proposed publication of an unauthorized statement as to the makeup of this committee. I have endeavored unsuccessfully to prevent publication, and I have reported the matter to my accounts. I propose we take no action until further undesirable publicity occurs. Agreed. Agreed. Although I feel it might be necessary to include a reference to the peace treaty in the preamble, I have submitted an alternative. I'm sure you'll all agree that whatever reference to the treaty that might be necessary to include in the Constitution, the treaty should not be made to appear as the origin and source of the Constitution. Here, here. And I have written to Professor Alfred O'Reilly of University College Cork to offer him a position on the committee as instructed by the chairman. Uh, can we meet again at 2.30 p.m. on January 30th? Agreed. Uh, correspondence from Mr. Michael Collins, Chairman, to Mr. Darrell Figures, Acting Chairman. Akara, I acknowledge receipt of four letters bearing today's date. First and foremost, I note you are using stationery, evidently from the British Stationery Office. This is to be discontinued. With regard to the resolution which you send, I already pointed out that this is a matter of policy, but of course, I shall put the resolution before the provisional government. I would, however, like strongly to emphasize and reiterate that we must not allow considerations as to whether or not the British pass our constitution to worry us unduly. The thing is to get the constitution, then let us fight for it if necessary. 
I am informing Professor O'Reilly that he is to join the committee. You have evidently misinterpreted my statement in regard to the appointment of further members for the committee. What I did say was that the committee had only to give me the name of any person that it required that I would immediately summon him to attend. This matter is of great importance as the provisional executive is responsible. And as a matter of fact, I would not ask anyone to join the committee without having his name formally approved by the provisional government. This is a matter that must be put right with the committee immediately. I may say that the expense which will be incurred in connection with the Shelburne is absolutely unwarrantable. I did not know that it was intended to take the Shelburne until it was taken. If I had known, I would not have consented. I am giving the necessary authority with regard to immediate payments after tomorrow's meeting of the Provisional Executive. Pakara Mihal Quilla. Meeting number three, Mr. Michael Collins, TD, Chairman of the Provisional Government, accompanied by Mr. Arthur Griffith, TD, President of the Door. I am referring to statements regarding this committee that have appeared in the press. I have attended this meeting to make it clear that I am chairman of this committee, which was set up under the direct authority of the provisional government. The government will make a formal announcement through the press about the makeup of this committee. If at any point the committee should feel that a further public statement on any point is desirable, then you will advise the government to that effect. But no other publicity of any sort should be allowed to occur. Is that clear? We should leave you to your work. It was agreed that the committee's discussion on drafts submitted to it should not be summarized in the minutes. I propose that Torek O'Toole should be requisitioned from the Public Records Office and added to the Secretariat. Seconded. Agreed. The committee discussed in detail is document 5, chapter 3, uh, legislature articles 1 to 18, and first house articles 1 to 12. After a long day, the meeting adjourned at 10 p.m. The sixth meeting of the committee discussed the powers of the second chamber and the relationship between the first and second chamber. It was agreed in minute four of the sixth meeting that the chairman should communicate with the government with regard to the Southern Unionists. The seventh meeting of the committee opened with a discussion regarding minute four of the sixth meeting. It was agreed that the committee should proceed with its work and leave the matter of the Southern Unionists to the government. The discussion on the second chamber continued. The eighth meeting was a concentrated discussion on the executive, while the ninth meeting centered on citizenship. At lunchtime, the ninth member of the committee arrived. Professor Alfred O'Reilly of University College Cork. Welcome to the committee, Professor. I wish to be crystal clear that the only reason I agreed to serve on this committee was on the understanding that I do not consider the treaty to be constitutionally binding and there is to be no mention of the king in any of the texts produced. <clears throat> the uh, 10th and 11th meetings of the committee were long discussions on the executive, the senate, and P. Dot or dot, that, that is proportional representation. At meeting 12 of the committee, a discussion ensued regarding the possible provision of the Constitution in regard to economic resources of Ireland. Mr. France undertook a, to draft articles embodying the principles set out in this document. One would surmise that our meetings were a touch chaotic, or that there was no clear focus. But this couldn't be further from the truth. We were following two very clear paths. The draft based on Collins' suggestions, and the figures draft. Michael's suggestions for a proposed draft constitution. Number one, Ireland shall be styled and known as the Irish Free State, which shall be derived from the people of Ireland alone. Two, the legislative power of the Irish Free State shall be vested in a parliament, which shall consist of the representative of the British Crown in Ireland to be called the Irish President, and the Senate and the House of Representatives and deputies. It shall have powers to make laws for the peace, order and good government of Ireland. 3. The President of Ireland shall be appointed in like manner as the Governor-General of Canada. 
Number four, the Senate should be composed as follows. Five, the House of Deputies should be composed as follows. Now, number six, regarding the oath. We must not allow in any expression that the executive power is vested in the king. Whatever the direct influence of these statements on the committee as a whole, Figgis had already circulated a memorandum on procedure, which detailed a strategy of approach remarkably similar to Michael's suggestions. Figgis' initial scheme envisaged a constitution of seven chapters. Number one, a preamble briefly reciting the rights of the people. Uh, Patrick, if I may. Of course. Uh, a preamble is the introductory part of a statute or deed stating its purpose, aims, and justification. Thank you. Uh, number two, general, dealing with the flag, rights of free assembly, and citizenship. That there should be no religious tests or differentiations. Indeed. Number three, dealing with the national assembly, popular assembly, upper house, and their relations in that order. Number four, executive government. By this method, it would be, appear clearly that the executive government consisted of ministers who are ministers of Dola Aaron, the representatives of the people, and therefore ministers of the people themselves. It would be shown clearly that all executive function, including the military forces, were created by democratic sanction. Number five, however, the king's representative. Uh, Mr. Morris says, Mayor. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> Number five. At this point, I may say that the title Resident Minister has been suggested to me, and I mention it at this point in order that it may be brought to the attention of the committee without professing any unnecessary enthusiasm for the title. It is obvious that this person, however named, however named will exercise certain authorities that would appear as though they had emerged from his own self-sufficient will, such as the prerogative of mercy and perhaps the appointment of judges. <laughs> the order suggested will show that these authorities are in fact bestowed upon him. In the same section, it will be necessary to deal with the persons who comprise his council. I believe that this will prove to be a matter of critical importance in my own judgment. I think the day of the Privy Councillors is long past, and the only council should be the entire ministry. Mr. Figgis's, or perhaps his advisor's, perspicacity is evident here. Uh, when Patrick, me again, uh, sorry. Perspicacity, the quality of having a ready insight into things, an inherent shrewdness, I suppose. Thank you, Ned. And the question of the Privy Council. <clears throat> uh, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, the highest court of appeal, of, of appeal in the British Empire. Privy meaning private or secret, they had the ear of the king. Unfortunately, they had the ear of three fanatical unionists too, in Carson, Sumner and Cave. Indeed, but Mr. Figgis was correct. The British were particularly alarmed by the exclusion of the Privy Council appeal, uh, by the assertion that the decisions of the Irish Supreme Court would be final and conclusive. Number six covered the judicature, and number seven, finance. Other sections can deal with various other unspecified matters, but these fall naturally into place if the order of the approach can be agreed. Whatever we may say about the strengths and weaknesses of the constitution of this committee, this plan, broadly speaking, was adopted, as can be seen in all subsequent drafts of the constitution. We moved quickly. We met daily, often for two sessions. And within three weeks, we had formulated a full-scale draft. This was our discussion on the provision of a second chamber. The Senate, effectively. I am completely opposed to a second chamber. A good one cannot operate, and a bad one is worse than useless. <laughs> yes, I am also opposed to a nominated chamber. The election of members on a basis of trade, profession, or other interest would be very difficult. I am also strongly opposed to Southern Unionists having special representation. I wouldn't question whether the clergy should be included in the upper house. Yeah. Murnahan and McNeil are also opposed to the idea of a house whose main function is to delay legislation. O'Byrne suggests the minimum age of 30 for voting and a small membership, large electoral areas and a fixed term of 10 years. Let's review quickly. 
If the Senate is devoid of power, no man of importance will sit on it. But I object to Mr. Francis' scheme, which only allows the selection of prominent men. The most important thing for Ireland now is quick legislation. If the Second House are elected, they may vote with the low. After this wide-ranging discussion, we agreed. The powers of the upper chamber will be suspensory, not veto. They don't have the power to initiate legislation, except in financial matters. They don't have the powers of revision, and its powers of suspension should not extend beyond a general election. This treatment gives you a good impression of the thoroughness of our work and our capacity to reach agreed recommendations quickly. Resolutions of disagreements were not always so smooth. From the outset, there were tensions. Figgis was great at attendance and drafting documents. It was also vain, unpopular, and suspicious. O'Reilly attended, rarely attended, but when he did, he attacked Figgis. Mr. Figgis, your original draft is no more than an English translation of the Weimar Constitution. I agree with you, Professor, but your attitude is, is purely individualistic. I understand that you have been meeting Erskine Childers regularly to discuss this constitution. I, I met him once for two minutes on a trial. And furthermore, Mr. Figgis, this committee is not taking into consideration the importance of Catholicism to this constitution. Minutes of the 20th meeting of the committee held at the Shelburne Hotel, Dublin, on Sunday the 19th of February, 1922, at 3 p.m. I would like to propose a sentence in the judiciary section prohibiting corporal punishment. I second that. Unfortunately, this proposal was not accepted in Ireland until much, much later. Uh, the committee then separated for the purpose of drafting the alternative proposals dealing with the Executive Council, which in modern terms would be the Cabinet. The main form of disagreement was neither personal nor religious. It hinged on the form of the Executive Council to be incorporated into the new Constitution. At the 21st meeting of the committee, it was agreed that the chairman would write to Professor O'Reilly asking if he had any alternative proposals to submit. I have looked over the draft as approved by the other members of the committee. I greatly regret that under practically every section, I am in disagreement therewith. I do not think that I should be justified in further encroaching on the time and attention of my colleagues. I therefore propose to proceed as rapidly as possible with my own draft, which I intend to present as an independent minority report. The minutes of the 24th meeting of the committee at the Shelburne Hotel Dublin on Friday, the 3rd of March. In view of the difference that had become apparent the previous day, the committee agreed it has become inevitable to present three separate drafts. The three groups were, therefore, occupied during the entire day with the preparation of their own drafts. Draft A was signed by Darrell Figgis, James McNeil and John O'Byrne. Draft B, signed by James Douglas, CJ France and Hugh Kennedy. Draft C was signed by Professors O'Reilly and Murnan. Mr. Figgis wrote a letter to Mr. Collins. Ahara. Since we were appointed to you, since we were appointed by you on the 24th of January and charged with the duty of framing the constitution for Sir Stolt Erin, we have met on 27 occasions in full committee. Unfortunately, it has pr not proved possible for me to be able to send you a draft constitution carrying the unanimous support of this committee and therefore send you three drafts marked A, B and C respectively. It will be apparent to you from the inspection of these drafts that they are substantially alike. All of them are inspired by the same spirit. Where they disagreed above all was on the structure of the Executive Council. In other words, how to choose the ministers. In draft A, the, the President of the Executive Council, who in effect is the Prime Minister, proposes the other ministers to the Chamber, which must give its approval in each case. The drafters of A wanted the system of government they designed to be as straightforward and as adaptable as possible. In draft C, the chamber first elects the president and then the president chooses the vice president and then the minister of external affairs. After this, the chamber elects the seven ministers as a group by P.R. 
the drafters of C thought it was a chance to avoid England and America's mistakes. They based their executive on the Swiss model. In draft B, the president appoints one third of the ministers. The other two thirds of ministers are appointed by a special Dáil committee. Ministers in this second group do not need to be members of the Dáil. The drafters of B designed their system specially so the Dáil could choose anti-treaty ministers for the government. They were trying to prevent a civil war. In my accompanying letter of draft B, I wrote that what the other two drafts failed to take into consideration, that whatever the future, we have one outstanding fact, one overwhelming fact in the present. That fact is Ireland is split into two contending forces. We hold that unity can be obtained. We hold that the country demands a constitution which makes unity possible. We want a provisional government to be able to say to the opposition, we desire you to cooperate with us in building up Ireland, in giving it strength. This is how we provide for you. You can hold important ministerial posts together with us on all internal affairs. We alone will be responsible for external affairs, and if we cannot deliver the goods, as you contend we cannot under the treaty as to external affairs, we alone shall be held responsible. When Mr. Figgis found out the drafters of Constitution B had written a note arguing for their text, he did the same. The authors of Draft A all signed it. <coughs> Akhara. As signatories of Draft A of the Constitution, it had not been our original intention to submit a separate covering letter. It was our belief that the differences between the three drafts would be sufficiently apparent to you. Learning that the signatories of draft B have put their points of view to you before you in an independent covering letter, it occurs to us that you might find it helpful if we were also to do the same. The difference between a rigid constitution and a flexible constitution has been frequently referred to by many writers. And it has always been proved that rigid constitutions prove irritating and obstructive of development. It is because we recognize that Executive B, apart from being dangerously experimental, is rigid, that we have found ourselves unable to recommend its adoption. Professor Monaghan and I were both sick in bed when these were written. Eventually, I myself wrote this about our executive. <clears throat> this is an adaptation of the Swiss system, itself an improvement on the American to Irish conditions. It is an effort, now that the opportunity has come and will not recur, to oust English political ideals and the party system. It is revolutionary, no doubt, but it will be accepted even by conservatives. It was a shame that because of their illnesses we did not have much time to speak with Oranley and Murnahan. Probably we would have come to an agreement. We thought the same. Finally, the provisional government chose B. Okay. Ah. This came. <coughs> Mr. Mortishead, can I ask you a question? Of course. Ethel Mat Matilda Kane from Ballymote in County Sligo, a stenographer, one of three, including Miss Saunders and Miss Jones. Their contribution to this constitution has been exemplary. Where do we fit in? I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand. We? Yes, us, Irish women. Where do we fit into this constitution? Well, I, I, um, well, it would, uh, um, Mr. Kennedy. <laughs> well, um, all citizens of the Irish Free State, without distinction of sex, who have reached the age of 21 years and who comply with the provisions of the prevailing electoral laws, shall have the right to vote for members of Dáil Éireann and to take part in referendum and initiative. All citizens of the Irish Free State, Sayerstadt Erwin, without distinction of sex, who have reached the age of 30 years and who comply with the provisions of the prevailing electoral laws, shall have the right to vote for members of Shannon Erwin. Now, Mr. Kennedy, you and I both know that you can't take all the credit for that, as it was clearly laid out in the 1960 proclamation that a permanent government would be elected by the suffrages of all her women. True, true, but... We did follow instructions. And I'm sure I speak for all the stenographers when I say that this is a constitution that is based on men discussing the rights of women with ne'er a woman on the committee. Why is there no woman on the committee, Mr. Kennedy? 
are, I imagine it's because there are no female lawyers as well. I'm begging your pardon, sir, but Miss April Deverell and Miss Frances Kyle were both called to the bar at the end of last year. First women ever in Ireland. Well, I suppose with the uh, negotiations and... Um, and not everyone on the committee is a lawyer, Mr. Kennedy. The sad truth, Miss Kane, is that it probably never occurred to us. Even if we had been inclined, there were very few women in the political sphere suitable. suitable. Most are common among and anti-treaty. They are against 419 to 63. They nicknamed it the Women and Children's Party. <laughs> to our credit, though, there is chapter one, Fundamental Rights of the People, in a draft called Document Number Three. Article one of this draft provided as follows. All Irish men and women have, as citizens of Serstad Aaron, fundamentally the same civil rights and duties. All Irish men and women are members of one common society. Just to let you know, Mr. Morris said, neither Miss Saunders or myself were able to attend work last week because of the fighting. I have written to Mr. Phyllis to notify him and let him know that we did instead work for St. John now. Thank you, Miss Kane. <clears throat> this was a very difficult time in Ireland, and more specifically in Dublin itself. In January, M. de Valera had resigned as president of the Dáil, and Arthur Griffith's motion in favour of the treaty was passed by 67 votes in favour to 54 votes against. In February, the Irish Free State Act 1922 is introduced in the British House of Commons. It provides for the dissolution of the Parliament of Southern Ireland and the election of a parliament to which the provisional government will be responsible. In early March, we presented our three drafts. We were very aware of the task before us. We were being asked to create a blueprint for a new state and more importantly to prevent a civil war and a return to hostilities. The significance of this was not lost on us. The constitutional experience of the members of the committee was limited. The system we were most familiar with was the British system, but we knew this was unsuitable in an Irish context. There is also the matter that the British system has the crown as sovereign we were all agreed that we wanted the people as sovereign. An obvious choice for us was the American system, and Kevin O'Shiel had written a book on it. Unfortunately, Kevin missed many of the meetings and declined to support any draft. The committee agreed the American system didn't suit Ireland because it was too federal. FCJ, if I may. Of course not. A federal system is a system of government in which several states form a unity but remain independent in internal affairs. I like the German or Weimar system. Yes, we're all very aware of that. There is no question that the best constitution around at the minute is the Swiss constitution. I had plenty of time to analyze it when I was imprisoned on Bear Island in Cork. The government have given all three drafts to George O'Brien, Emeritus Professor of Economics at UCD, and Timothy Heath from Cork. Those three masterpieces you sent me were raw mesh and pure fudge. What is wanted is dry, unassailable, frigid technique, which can't be quarreled with by either Carson or de Valera, but which, by its generality, imports and attracts the utmost sovereignty without saying so. This can be done more effectively by vagueness than by assertions. Not definition, but looseness is what's needed, provided the looseness favours the Irish construction or interpretation hereafter. We need vagueness instead of definition, but above all, the definition of Tirna No or Noah's Ark. Leave no loophole for attack or cramp. Banish sentiment. Imitate the style of a bill of costs. Cherish the acorn and keep away from transplanting oaks. Have one eye on Carson and the other on De Valera. With regard to Mr. Healy's criticism, I recorded only that the suggestion that the committee appreciated is the suggestion to shorten, and that we had already done that as far as was possible at the time. Here, here. Uh, the criticism of George O'Brien were a great deal more detailed and difficult to deal with. It was always likely that the government would choose B as the basis for the Constitution. 
I worked consistently with Michael on the treaty as his legal advisor, and afterwards spent many months dealing with the British government. I had a hand in drafting the main structure of the Constitution, so I had an unfair advantage over the others. I was extremely proud to be involved in this committee. And while we were disappointed at being unable to come up with one single draft, what we achieved in the time frame we were given was remarkable. Hugh Kennedy was the first Chief Justice of the state and served from 1924 to 1936. He was also a member of the first Supreme Court, which included James Murnahan and Gerald Fitzgibbon. He died suddenly of a heart attack at the age of 57. When the government came to appoint judges to the hierarchy of new courts in 1924, there was quite a shortage of suitable Catholic judges, and James Murnahan was surprised to be promoted from his position of junior counsel to the high court. The government were anxious to achieve a balance between unionist and nationalist appointments. A year later, Charles O'Connor passed, and Murnahan was appointed to the Supreme Court with Hugh. James Murnahan was a connoisseur of fine art, and his house in Upper Fitzwilliam Street contained valuable furniture and many paintings, which he had bought in the early 1920s in de dealers' shops along the Dublin Quays. He retired from the bench in 1953 and died in Dublin on 13th of November 1973, aged 92. His wife, Alice, survived a robbery of his art by Martin Cowell in 1988. She passed away at the age of 104. Clement J. France was recommended to the committee by James Douglas because of his American legal experience and his work with the White Cross organization. Douglas regretted the decision afterwards when receiving information from Irish sources in America. The face value of the correspondence makes France look like a, a pure adventurer. But adventurer or not, France made a sizable contribution to the Constitution with regard to natural resources and complete economic freedom for Ireland. One of the most important contributions of all the committee members to the Constitution was made by Terrell Figgis. Mostly unheard of and written out of Irish history, he was a major influence on the shaping of the Constitution, both in his daily attendance at the, at the committee and in his subsequent debate at the Constituent Assembly. His career was to end in tragedy. In June of 1922, Harry Boland sent three men to his house. They burst into his home terrifying his wife Millie, who assumed they were coming to kill him. They rammed him into a chair and shaved off half his beard to teach him a lesson. The repercussions of this were tragic. Millie never fully recovered and after took her own life. Later, Darrell fell in love with a young dancer who became pregnant. She got peritonitis and died as a result. Publicly, he was accused of aiding abortion and his career began to crumble. He rented a small room in a boarding house in London, and blocking all the doors and windows with cloths, he gassed himself. His passion and love for a new Ireland has never been recognized. His contribution to the way we live today is immeasurable. He was a very proud Republican. James McNeil was a brother of Owen McNeil, and a former civil servant. Having failed to gain a seat in the incoming Senate of the Irish Free State, McNeil was offered the position of first High Commissioner of the Irish Free State in London. He replaced Tim Healy in 1928 to become the second Governor General of the Irish Free State. James McNeil died in London in 1938. Kevin O'Shill served as Commissioner of the Irish Land Commission from 1923 until his retirement in 1963. He was the author of a number of books on the history of partition and Irish land settlement. John O'Byrne succeeded Hugh Kennedy as Attorney General and was appointed a judge of the High Court in 1926. O'Byrne delivered his most celebrated judgment in the Sinn Féin Funds case on the 31st of July 1947. O'Byrne's much cited judgment is universally regarded as one of the cor cornerstones of Irish constitutional law. A very able judge with a very fine and incisive writing style, O'Byrne must take a very high place amongst those who have been judges of the Supreme Court since its foundation. Alfred Raleigh, born in 1884 in the Stone County Kerry to Thomas and Julia Raleigh. 
He changed his name by deed poem in 1920 to Alfred O'Reilly. He served on the Cork Corporation with Tomás McCurtain and Terence McSweeney. While he was deeply unhappy with the final draft produced by this committee, his own work heavily influenced Eamon de Valera in the construct of the 1937 Constitution. He was a pugnacious polemicist who jousted with such eminences as H.G. Wells and Bernard Shaw. He was a man of stature and a formidable Catholic intellectual. And who could not be impressed as well as entertained by his exuberant claim, I have not now the smallest doubt that I have Einstein refuted. <laughs> In his memoirs, James Douglas stated, I do not think I have ever worked on a committee where there was more good fellowship and where it was possible to have strong differences of opinion without any personal feeling whatsoever. James Douglas served as vice chairman of Shannadair in 1922 to 25 and was a senator during the years 22 to 54, exhibiting remarkable skill on constitutional issues. He died in 1954. The formal British response to the draft Irish Constitution was very negative. They argued it, is, it was a Republican Constitution in all but name. After a short negotiation, finally we agreed on a draft that was different in several ways from what the committee had produced. The articles about fundamental rights were removed and ultimate legal authority was vested in the treaty. The British insisted all Irish language and terms be removed, labelling them uncivilised. Finally, all ministers, however chosen, must swear the oath of allegiance. The oath was written into the Constitution as Article 17. One hundred years ago today, on the, on the 25th of October 1922, the Dáil ratified the Constitution. In practice, gradually, over the 1920s, the Constitution's authority was erased. In 1937, a new Constitution was ratified, Bunrocht Meherin, largely based on O'Reilly's draft C. But the Oireachtas judiciary, and in many ways, the pre pre presidency, all retained the structure we had envisaged in 1922. The ideals in our draft Constitution would not come to fruition for many years. It was secular and equal. Instead of the king, it gave the authority to the Irish people. We believed it was time to give the true nature of authority to those over whom it was wielded.